As you said, for the first five years of your studio career, you played 12 and 6 string guitars, and then that 1963 session you mentioned, there's something I've always wanted to clarify, which was, which of these three was the most accurate? Did you volunteer to play the bass, or did they politely ask well, you to they, do it, they, or I mean, they, they just told you to? Me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had been playing the Dano bass guitar here and there, you know, like yeah. Sonny and Cher, and then for Adobe Gray, I'm in with the in crowd, you know, I'm playing, mm -hmm. uh, playing the Dano on that, and the Dano on, on some other things, too. Right. So, I mean, so they knew that I was kind of like bass-oriented, and I started to, to make up bass lines on, on guitar, too, see? Right. so they wanted me to play bass, and that's what happened. Yeah, because I was wondering if, even if that bass player hadn't failed to show up, if you would have naturally gravitated towards the bass anyways, because you were oh, off in... No, huh? No? Uh, if there was no need, I'd have stayed play, playing guitar, but hmm. I'd have got sick of it because I, <laughs> I was so tired of playing little dinky lines, and I had been playing the 12 string guitar on the, the Sonny and Cher stuff. That was as far from jazz as, as you could get, so, so, I mean, so I was getting tired of that. But as soon as I started playing bass lines, that seemed like it was a lot of fun, and I could make up the lines that I wanted, and, and, and the people just loved it, and they loved the sound that I got, too because I played with the pick. But, I mean, but there were three or four other bass players that also played with the pick. Most of the stuff that you heard that was cut in Los Angeles uh, studios it, in the 60s was done with the pick. Right. And so they used to hire a string bass, and they'd hire a, a Dano bass guitar, and then a Fender bass. And then, and then I come along, and I get the sound of all three of those mm -hmm. basses in one. They just loved the sound, and they loved the idea that I could invent to... Yeah. Lines, you know, like it did. One of the most distinct characteristics of your sound to me and what makes it so easily recognizable is the precision that each note is struck with. They're each articulated very clearly with equal volume, but without ever sacrificing the feel. Because a lot of the, the guys who play with their fingers, there's less consistency in the volume of each individual note. They hit some harder and some softer. And yeah, well, it seems like it's that way now, too. Uh, you have to know how to play with the pick. You have to play it with a flat wrist. You can't lift your wrist up in the air. You have to know where on the string that you play. You have to play at the end of the neck, never next to the bridges, because you don't get a, a, a good sound there. And let, when you're playing at the end of the neck, then as you hit the string, then you get the full response of the string there. Right. Uh, plus, you have to play down on the down beats and up on the up beat. And yeah. you have to do it all with the flat wrist because that's where the, the power is. You know, if you have a flat wrist and you can feel something touch on the bottom of, of your thumb muscle, then you're, you're playing with the right technique. And so you learn all that quickly when you're listening to your bass being recorded time and time again, huh? You learn what works quickly. Well, my teacher, Horace Hatchett, taught me that on guitar, and it just seemed to work really, really well with, with, with electric bass. And then later on when I went back to teaching... And uh, this time it was bass, and then I had all the guys from all the hot rock groups of that day in the 70s, you know, they'd come and take picking. I, I absolutely got, got them to picking the, yeah. the right way, down on the downbeat and up on the upbeat. I mean, it's pretty simple. If, if you know how to pat your foot and you pat your right hand at the same time that you pat your left foot, and then you got it, see? And when I hear a song, and I can tell it's you, it's a combination of things, but the main thing I get is the evenness of all the notes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's called technique. <laughs> <laughs> you, now, now, a lot of the pick sounds didn't come through on some of the, the tunes that they think is, is, is played with fingers, you know, like on some of the Motown things, because they did add a little bit of compression on the, mm -hmm. some of those dates, so too. Well, we should probably mention that uh, I think most people just assume that all the Motown recordings were done in Detroit, but in actual fact, they were in Southern California with an operation there for many years. Yeah, well, I'd say about 35 to 40 percent from 63 on was done out here because Motown had offices out here, and I'm, I'm the second one of nine bass players that they hired in the 60s right. out here. Things like the Four Tops and the Supremes and... Yeah, especially those groups, but my kids even met B.B. Wonder, and I played a, a, a show with him at the Shrine Auditorium, too, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of fun. Oh, yeah. It was jam-packed with people, too, and they, they chased us to our cars when we were <laughs> trying to leave, too. It was very, very scary. I, I never want to experience that again. That, yeah. that was too weird for me. <laughs> Well, I know everybody out there is expecting me to ask you something about the Beach Boys. And what I think is interesting about them is that you initially played guitar for them, like on Surfing USA, for example. And then once you were a bass player, you were, you were playing... Yeah, yeah, well, it's just, I mean, rhythm guitar, you know, on, right. on that kind of stuff. 
And then it was was bass from about 64 on. Then I became the number one call uh, bass player, meaning that most of the record companies called you first, you know, right. that kind of thing. And so, and so that that's how I got in there. And then little by little, Brian Wilson wrote the music. He, he's he's the only one of the the gang that that really did because we, we had to in, invent lines with, with the others. But he mm-hmm. he actually wrote his own music. Uh, brought the parts in and so it's kind of fun to, to work for him because you, you saw him grow very very fast he, he he got out of that surf rock into a lot of different sounds and i didn't even know that he was a bass player until like <laughs> later on <laughs> yeah. you know I, I, I yeah that's funny he used to come down and come in the room and he'd sit down there and play the piano you know to to, to let us hear the, how the tune went and then he'd go back in the booth he was like phil in the sense that he'd take his time and, and cut one tune, you know, like yeah. for, for, for three hours, which got very boring. You had to drink a, a, a ton of coffee. In fact, <laughs> that's my trouble right now is this coffee because it's uh, it's very hot, hard on the heart at times, too. You right. know? So anyway, <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd be uh, drinking that coffee and then the guys would be smoking the, the cigarettes, too, you know, just to stay awake, you know, to stay alert and all, you know, because, when, I mean, when you cut a tune, you, you're playing heavy. Well, there's no reason for him to play bass if he had you there, so. Well, I didn't know that that he played bass, but everybody used us. I mean, right. if they wanted a hit, hit, hit record, that they used us. A lot of times we'd cut tracks, and if the track would hit, then they'd form a group around that track of music, so, mm-hmm. so that's what happened. Well, did you think it was kind of strange that in 1967 you recorded the Smile Sessions and they weren't released until 37 years later, <laughs> in 2004? Well, you know, when you're in the studio cutting music, you do what you can. You're paying attention and you're playing as hard as you can and you can cut the music. And then as soon as you walk out the door, you forget about that because you've got to mm-hmm. get ready for the next date of the day, you know, and you run around with your gear and stuff in your car, and then you jump in there, and then the uh, movers have your second amp there on, on the second date of the day, so I'd run in, and I'd do the same thing for the next group. I mean, it might be Ray Charles, it might be all kinds of, of, of people all, mm-hmm. all on the same day, different styles of music, so whatever he was going to do with the music, we had no idea of, you know, so, but I mean, but one so well, I'd hear some of the stuff on the radio and think, yeah, boy, that, that sounds good. You know, it, it, this sounded really good, what he was doing. Well, I know that you're, you're well known for playing on uh, the Pet Sounds album, and I know that uh, Paul McCartney's a big fan of that album, and he and Brian Wilson acknowledged the influence they had on each other. I can hear the influence of your playing on the bass on Sgt. Pepper. Did um did McCartney or anybody else for that matter influence your playing or were you as you said were you just too busy no, to follow? I never listened to anybody. Oh, you didn't uh, have time. It, it didn't have time, and if I did have time, I'd make it down to the jazz club. I'm right. gonna hear some, some, some bebop. <laughs> you know, just because you're in the studio cutting rock and roll doesn't mean that you go out to hear rock and roll. I mean, we were jazz players, you know, mm-hmm. and then we we would go hear jazz, you know, if we had any time at all. Back to you saying you were so busy. Is it true that instead of changing the strings on your bass, you just go to the store and give them your bass and get a oh, new bass? Oh, I take the <laughs> instrument in and and just run in on my lunch break and I say, okay, get, I mean, give me another bass because I need a new set of strings. I check to make sure that that the neck was okay. That's about once every two years. I, I usually had two basses. One one was just there, and I'd, I'd always be, be running in to get a new bass, and then I'd make sure that the strings were okay. But a lot of times, I, I'd have to take the neck off and put a shim in the neck, too, because a lot of times those necks weren't that great. The bass was the board with strings on it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was the only bass that got that sound. It was the Fender Precision, you know, and it, it, it got that sound with the flat wound strings, and I used the, uh, the felt uh, as a mute on top. You just need something j- just to lay on top of the strings just to cut out the bad overtones and, and undertones that would kill your sound, you know, and then sounded good on the record. You so you'd play two years oh, before yeah, you change strings. Oh yeah, I hate strings. Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one solution. If they're paying you well, just get a new bass and keep going. That's it. That's <laughs> it. I mean, it was a tool. A lot of people think, oh no, you didn't keep all your instruments. I said, heck no. I mean, the the bass was a tool. It was a business. The only instrument that I do miss is the Epiphone guitar, but yeah. but when I started to move back and forth between here and Colorado, the, the, the instrument started to fall apart. It, anyway, and, and at one time, this, I mean, this was when somebody tried to steal my publishing company from me, and, and I lost everything for, for for about three or four years, and 
And so I had to sell the guitar to move back to Colorado. <laughs> you know, it, it was as simple as that. But the fellow re restored it, and it's in a museum some, wow. somewhere out here on the West Coast now. Well, that's cool. Yeah, a lot of people have that emotional attachment to instruments. And personally, I'm kind of like you. It's like I never really regretted. I never had, like, seller's remorse, really. I just moved on. as The music was well, in me, well, I not mean, the well, instrument. I mean, that one instrument I, I, I uh, did because I played a lot of jazz on that one. Right. I mean, I used it to de arm and pick up. And I played play some bebop. I did a lot of good uh, good dates with that too. That I mean, that's the instrument that I used on used lost that love and feeling. So. Right. Oh, and Donka Shane too. Right. I originally I heard that sort of um pa pa bass part, and then I was glad to hear that you were doing the guitar, not the bass. <laughs> yeah. No, I did the guitar on Wayne Newton, and it felt good to play some some jazz again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's a it's a fun song. I, I've always liked it. Good feel on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Dark a shame, darling, dark a shame. Thank you for all the joy and pain. Picture show, second balcony was the place we'd meet. Second seat, go Dutch treat, you were sweet. Dark a shame, darling. Save those lies, darling, don't explain I recall Central Park in fall How you tore your dress, what a mess I confess, that's not all Dark as shame Well, back in the 60s, um, the policy by mutual consent with the record labels and the studio musicians was to keep your contributions anonymous, but there was a little scandal with the monkeys about it leaking out that though they could in fact play their instruments, they actually hadn't played on any of their hits. Um, did your name well, come they out? Did something. They, I mean, they did something, but they used us on most of the stuff that they that right. they cut. But they were pretty fair, you know, like to get on, on, on stage and play. I mean, just uh -huh. like the Beast Boys could get up there and, and play and sing, too. Right. Uh, but, I mean, but I think the, the singing was so good that the, that the people didn't notice that it wasn't quite as good as the record. Now, right. there's a group called the Hondells and, and the Marquettes, and I've had people say that they would go hear them, and they simply didn't sound like the record, you because know. So they, they, I mean, they always wondered about that. All right, because they weren't on the record. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what happened. So. Well, we should also touch on this thing about uh, Hal Blaine. He was the, the drummer on a lot of Monkey Sessions and used to joke that while they were holding a press conference in one studio saying they played on the records, you guys were in the next studio recording their next album. Mm -hmm. But but speaking of him, he's used, <laughs> he's used this term, the wrecking crew, which, which you don't well, recall. We, I mean, we were never known huh. as that. That's Hal's self-promotional mm -hmm. thing. That's his creation. And, and, and that's fine if he wants to call his, his book that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but it really promotes some wrong identities about us. So, so anyway, I'm not sad about that. But you were actually known as the Click? Yes, right, right. Uh, a lot of times they'd say, well, get the Click. The Click was about <laughs> 50 or 60 of us, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, out of the pool of about 400 studio musicians who, who worked all the time here. You did a lot of sessions with Hal Blaine, but you also did a lot with other drummers, and everybody who's ever been in a band understands how vital it is to have good chemistry in your rhythm section. So, well, that's Earl Palmer yeah. on the Mission Impossible hit, yeah. too. And then the hit, hit that we did, um, I Don't Need No Doctor, that we did with Ray Charles, you know, it was, a, it was a big hit. Quite a few big hits were with Earl Palmer. That's Earl playing on You've Lost That Love and Feeling, too. Wasn't he also the drummer for Fats Domino? Yeah, if you click on the Earl Palmer Memorial mm -hmm. site, then you can see yeah. a ton of the, the hits that he did. I think he did a lot of the Solomon Burke things, too, you know. And uh -huh. he, he, talk about Ray Charles. Just before you called, I saw that film about him, mm -hmm. um, and it really made me very emotional to, to see him again, you know, because I, I, I spent a lot of great dates with Ray Charles, you know, and we cut the America thing. Mm -hmm. There and it shows the studio of Ray's too, where we did it all the time. You know, it was really nice to see that and to see Ray and hear him sing again. It's a lot of funky stuff that we cut too, like bum bum, ba da 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 bum bum, 
Ba do ba do ba boom boom, kind of a boogaloo. Da 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 ba bum 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 bum. Well, I feel so bad. Ba do da do da. said you did your part and moved on to the next session but they had your stuff to work with to build on 